Hi, my name is Michael. The console mini, where you take a retro console like an NES or a Super NES, and you shrink it inside and include a bunch of games within it and sell it to the retro gaming market, has been taking the world by storm over the past few years. And whenever these systems come out, the first thing that always excites the bitterest controversy, the most important thing is, what games are are going to be on it. Because when you buy it, if it doesn't have good games, what's the point? You know, you can have all the nostalgia in the world if it has terrible games on it, why bother? Fans tend to want to stick the absolute priceless best 30 or 40 games that you can find onto those systems, whereas the companies are a little bit less happy about that. They seem to want to include a weird mix of some great games, a lot of okay games, some meh, why did this make it on here games, and just some head scratchers about why would anyone want to play this 20, 30 years later. I was shocked to find that a dream of mine, that the TurboGrafx-16, the system that I had when I was a child, is finally going to be getting a Mini. I, I never thought it would, because I thought it was too obscure, but apparently there are enough people out there who want the TurboGrafx Mini that are, uh, you know, they're going to release one, and I am overjoyed about that, and I am very curious about what games are going to be going on there, because, as I said, these these console minis have had sketchy histories about not including the absolute pristine best games that they could find. Uh, they've released six games for each of the Japanese and the American releases of the mini. I didn't know that they had separate releases. I don't remember that coming up. Uh, you know, when talking about the other minis, that there were going to be separate games on the different areas, which seems kind of silly. I don't think they should really do that. And I'm kind of worried that Castlevania Rondo of Blood is mentioned on the Japanese one, but not on the American one. That's a little bit irritating. I hope they can merge later on and get, you know, cross-pollinate between games. But anyway, I'm here to talk about 20 games, not in alphabetical order, by the way, just, you know, I'm just going off the top of my head here, that I have decided should be on the TurboGrafx Mini to make it worth purchasing. The games that absolutely should be on there, uh, no matter what. So, without further ado, here are the 20 games that I think absolutely should be on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Newtopia and Newtopia 2. Now, let's get this out of the way at the front. These are Legend of Zelda clones. They're just straight-up rip-offs, essentially, of the first Legend of Zelda and Link to the Past. You have a compass when you go into dungeons, a map. You even have bombs that you use to blow up bits of wall here and there. It plays exactly like it, looks exactly like it. But guess what? It's also fantastic, because a game that plays and looks exactly like The Legend of Zelda is going to be fantastic, just like The Legend of Zelda is. And the Newtopia games were magnificent. They were clones, but they were excellent clones of a great game. And I think that they really had a lot of replay value to them, exploring the different lands. It's not as perfect as the Zelda games, of course, not as good as the original. I heartily recommend them if you like The Legend of Zelda games. And who doesn't? You're going to love these. And they need to be on the system, at least Newtopia too the better of the two games, but I think both of them should be on there because they're both excellent experiences. San San. Now, I, I didn't expect a lot when I first messed with this game because, well, the name is kind of weird, but it's actually a great action platformer for the TurboGrafx-16. You play as a little monkey kid who's part of the ubiquitous uh, Journey to the West mythology that's one of the most important parts of East Asian literature, who is going on a journey to fight against a bunch of monsters. It's in Japanese, so I don't exactly know what's going on, but there's like a shop mechanic, so there is some RPG elements, and the fighting and the platforming are really addictive and very tight, tighter usually than I'd expect for the TurboGrafx-16. This feels like good NES platforming, and I had a heck of a lot of fun, and there's some surprising depth to the gameplay as you get through with it. You really have to spend quite a lot of time mastering the jumping and attacking in order to defeat these enemies. It's a fantastic game. Unfortunately, it is in Japanese, so presumably they're not going to want to translate something from Japanese into English, but it would require such a minimal, such a minimal amount of effort to translate. Probably a first-year Japanese student could do it because it's so, it's just like, buy this thing at my shop. You know, there's very little beyond that. But, but anyway, it's a great game, it's a lot of fun, and it's one of the best times I had on this system. Bonk's Revenge. I love Bonk the Caveman, also known as PC Kid in Japan. And I think that he is not only a great character, but he is on par with Sonic the Hedgehog and Super Mario for me. I think he's one of the great 
platformer character. He's one of the great mascot characters ever, and I love this little guy. He's so adorable. Attacking in this game where you smash someone with your head is just so satisfying. There's just so some, something perfect about it that's better than stepping on an enemy as Super Mario, just whamming into them with your head with this wonderful sound effect. Also, the game looks absolutely gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful, bright, colorful games I've ever played, and it really just inspires joy and happiness when I play this game. I absolutely absolutely adore Bonk's Revenge, and it's just one of the great platformers of the era, of the era of great platformers. Now, tragically, they seem to have included the first Bonk game in America, and that's a little bit questionable, because while Bonk 1 and 3 are great games, Bonk 2, otherwise known as Bonk's Revenge, is the best, to me, the game in the series, and it would be really a shame if they included the other ones without understanding that 2 is probably the best, and I would say acknowledged as the best. It has the best platforming, these amazing huge boss fights, it looks incredible. It's just such a joy to play. I've been playing it on and off since I was a kid, and I love this game. It, it really needs to be on the system. You know, maybe along with 1 and 3, but definitely they can't exclude Bonk's Revenge. New Zealand Story. This was also released as Kiwi Crazy on the NES, and it looks horrible compared to the Turbo Graphics version. You can see how much better the Turbo Graphics could handle the color. It really pops there. It it looks you know you, you can't go back to play this or New Adventure Island on the NES because it just looks so bad. But New Zealand Story, you play as an, an adorable little Kiwi who has a bow and arrow for some reason. I don't know how he got that. I mean. Do people in New Zealand arm Kiwis with bows and arrows routinely? Is that like an ancient Maori rite or something? Anyway, look, you have a bow and arrow and you have to rescue your girlfriend. It's an, it's an incredible action platformer. It's very hard eventually because you can only take one hit and then you're dead. But otherwise, it's a heck of a lot of fun. It looks beautiful. The jumping and attacking are very tight. I had a heck of a lot of fun with New Zealand Story, and it's another game you can pick up and play very quickly. It's a great addition to the system, and I think it would be perfect for the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Just a, a fun little game to throw in on there. I'm glad that they're including the East books 1 and 2, which is one of the formative... JRPGs released originally back in the late 1980s. This was released all over the place on a variety of systems, including re-releases on the Nintendo DS pretty recently. Uh, I don't know if the Turbo Graphics version is the best version of the first two East games, but they do look pretty good on there. I've, I haven't played them on the Turbo Graphics yet. I've only played them on other systems. Uh, the e the first two East games are sort of like. If, you're, if you love JRPGs, you're probably going to think of them as kind of like this is a prototypical version of a JRPG really early on. You know, before, you know, almost like in the Hydlide era of the late 1980s, before it really shifted into something that we recognize that, you know, this, is, this came out right around the time that Final Fantasy I and Dragon Warrior did. And it's even more primitive than either of those two games. You actually can only attack by, like, bashing into enemies. It's it's not the most fun game for me. I mean, I played through it recently on the, on the Nintendo DS a couple of years ago, and it, you know, it's okay. You know, I had an, you know, meh. I, I didn't really think much of it. I think it would actually be better if they included East 3 and 4, more modern, complicated games, which were also on the TurboGrafx CD, but I don't know if those were released in the U.S. or only in Japan, and thus would require that translation, which is really kind of an irritant that, you know, that that's such a stumbling block here, when it probably could be solved pretty quickly with some very elementary translation. I mean, it would be like it was back in the day, where they could barely translate anything correctly, you know? Who cares? Just just release it, you know, release it untranslated. I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out a way. I'll sit there with a Japanese language text and just try to figure it out. You know, just, I mean, it, it seems to be better than East 1 and 2, but those are not bad games, by the way. They're a formative part of the history of JRPGs. Splatterhouse. Oh. Be still my beating heart and then rip it out and throw it at the wall. This game is a masterpiece of gore. It is absolutely... It, you know, back in the day, before we had Doom, before we even had Mortal Kombat, I think, it was very rare to see any scary horror stuff in a video game. It was there, but it was unusual, and you probably couldn't see it if you were a kid because you were probably shielded from it. 
And this was one of those games that just introduced an entire generation of kids to splatter films, to gore. You play as a, essentially Jason Voorhees, a character that resembles him with a special spooky mask from hell, and you wander around a mansion beating these hideous monsters to death, and it looks extraordinary. The background with these twisted wretches that are chained to the wall with vomit pouring out of them, and it's acidic, and you have to fight these incredible bosses that are maggots spewing out of some big... Bo it's incredible. The game is just... Unfortunately, you know, I do have to admit that the game is very simplistic and primitive, and outside of my nostalgia factor about how much I like it, it does play very simply. It's an extremely basic left-to-right platformer with not a lot of depth to the combat where you just hammer away at, with the attack again and again. There's, no, there's not a lot there for much of it. Um... I mean, it's not absolutely dismal or anything like that, but it probably, compared to, say, Vice Project Doom on the NES, you know, it's not like a sophisticated, interesting kind of action platformer game, but but still very much worth the time and effort to check this out. I, I really... I, I can't imagine this is not going to be on both systems. It has to be. It's just a legend in the Turbo Graphics and, and the video game community in general. It has to be on there. Military Madness. Now this is a strategy game which is really unusual for the time because they were just sort of just being invented right around now in the late 80s, early 90s, and to see one on a console, especially not a CD, this is a Hue card, this is the regular cartridge thing that you put in there, these little credit card things, and uh, it was fantastic. You know, this is an incredible experience for an early strategy game. And it's surprisingly deep where you have to use terrain to your advantage and figure out what units are good against other units. And you have to pay attention and read the manual and figure out what's going on or you're going to be obliterated, obliterated by the, uh, the computer who's not going to be messing around. You can spend a long time figuring out this game and learning all of the nuances to it. I thought it was great. It was a heck of a lot of fun. It, it felt a lot like Advanced Wars. I wonder if they're connected in some way, where you sort of move these pieces around on a board, and it's, it's just fantastic. And if you like strategy games, you're going to love this. I really think this should be on there. This game has one of the most epic openings of any video game I've ever seen, as you're dueling with this evil red-haired guy, and he knocks you off a cliff, and there's darkness all around, and it looks like it's in the middle of a thunderstorm. It just feels amazing. I, I just love this. And, you know, I've been obsessed with Conan ever since I was a little kid, and, you know, if you're obsessed with Conan, you want to play as this muscle-bound warrior who's wearing a loincloth and carrying a, a sword. It, this game is, has one of the darkest, most grim, and kind of unpleasant atmospheres spheres of any of the games featured on the Turbo Graphics. It, the monsters are genuinely kind of creepy, and the world you play in is very dark and kind of scary. It's it's not splatterhouse horror scary, but, and well, sometimes the monster is like this weird boss robot that's sort of part skull and part machine. Everything about the game is sort of creepy and scary, and the music is excellent and very atmospheric. This game is amazing, and I highly recommend it. It needs to be on this system. The first Legendary Axe game eh, didn't really have any of these qualities. You know, the platforming and fighting were okay, but I didn't really enjoy it nearly as much. And to be honest, it didn't have that cool, dark atmosphere that the second game did, so eh. I kind of don't care about it as much. Parasol Stars. Now, a lot of people are familiar with the game Bubble Bobble that was released on a number of systems, including the NES back in the late 1980s. And that's a great puzzle platformer where you play as a little dinosaur guy and run around blowing bubbles. They released a sequel called Rainbow Islands, but the third game in the series not a lot of people played called Parasol Stars, where you play as this adorable little urchin named Bubby, who runs around with some sort of magical umbrella that allows him to fly around, but also if he just touches any creature with the umbrella, it causes them to go unconscious, and then he lifts their unconscious carcass and heaves it at their friends and, um, you know, hits them and causes them to die. It's a, it's a lot less dark than I'm making it out here in this explanation, but I love how bright and colorful it is. It actually gets surprisingly challenging, but still a doable challenge later on in the game as you start fighting across these various planets, including a music world, an underwater world, a forest world, and all of the monsters leave these wonderful treasures behind.
crowns, chalices, all kinds of food and beverages. It just looks like an extraordinary game. It's so fun just to sit down and play this for a few hours. And I, I mean, I just, I, I, you know, Bubble Bobble is great, but I think I actually like Parasol Stars a lot better because it just... It feels more fun to play it. It's not as brutally difficult as Bubble Bobble. And there are these boss fights that you encounter periodically that are a lot of fun, too. And, you know, it's just great, and I love this little guy. Blazing Lasers. This is an absolutely fantastic game. The Turbo Graphics was known for a number of things, but one of the things it was known for was shmups. In other words, shoot 'em ups Video games, it's one of the oldest type of video games where you play as a spaceship shooting a bunch of other spaceships, typically in space. It involves space a lot, and there, there have been thousands of different games of this type. I'm not really a huge fan of this genre, but my favorite shoot 'em up was actually on the TurboGrafx-16, and that's Blazing Lasers. The game, like a lot of other TurboGrafx games, is very bright and colorful. It looks absolutely gorgeous. The backgrounds of the starships you're fighting look incredible. And I really love how the uh, the fighting is done in the game, because there's an addictive quality where you choose between five or six different weapon types, and you have to gather up these purple orbs to gradually power the weapon up, and it changes shape as you do that. So everything sort of looks different and it's always changing as you go through the game and you sort of want to keep going and get stronger and stronger and stronger up until the boss. And it also has my absolute favorite level of any one of these types of games where you fight giant brains in space. There's just something about giant space brains in space fighting your spaceship. That's just the perfect mixture of space and brains. It, it just looks incredible. Fantasy Zone. Now, this is another shoot 'em up, but well, it, it's it kind of feels a lot different. It's not like R type or anything, but it, it's a shoot 'em up where you sort of move around to different parts of this map in a loop, trying to destroy these little alien bases with your starship here and avoiding the monsters while you're trying to do that. It also has a weird RPG element. A lot of games, I think, on this system introduced an RPG element that I hadn't really seen before. And you go in and buy upgrades, making your ship faster, doing a special laser attack, etc. And you have to destroy all of these creatures and collect money from them to buy things at the shop, and then you can destroy more of the bosses at the end. And this game is just so fun. It was released on a number of other systems, too. It's not just uh, the Turbo Graphics, but I think it looks best here. It looks bright and very, very pink and very colorful. I really enjoy that. I, I, th I just think this is a fantastic game. It's an addictive shooter that plays differently than the other shooters. It's a little bit slower than the other ones, and the boss fights in it are amazing. It just, all the monsters look incredible, and your ship has tiny little feet when it runs in the ground. It's adorable, I love that, but this game really should be on the list. It's a lot of fun. Now, we can't talk about Turbo Graphics without talking about R-Type, one of the greatest shooter games ever made. As soon as you hear that J.S. Bach music at the very beginning, you know you're in for an incredible experience. This one was released on a number of different systems, and probably the Turbo Graphics isn't the best one, but the Turbo Graphics CD version, which has all of these extra features to it, it looks great, it plays great, it's a really, really hard game. I'm not a shoot 'em up type guy, so I'm not great at these games, but it just, it looks beautiful, it plays beautifully. This game has to be on there. It's one of the classic shoot 'em ups ever of any system, and the Turbo Graphics version of it is extraordinary. I highly recommend this. Sidearms. Now, I know, again, I said I didn't really like shooters that much, but you, you have to talk about them a lot with the Turbo Graphics 16. There are just so many of them here. Uh, Sidearms is an extraordinary game that was originally released in the arcade, but you play as this weird mech flying through space, and the shooting is just so tight and so perfect. I, I love it. It's a, it's a left-to-right shooter, and uh, it actually plays a little bit slower, I think, than the other shoot -em, shoot em ups it, It's not like a bullet storm or bullet hell shoot -em up I think is what they call them. And uh, I was able to master this game uh, a lot better than I was R-Type and other games like it. I spent a long time trying this out, and, you know, what can I say? The shooting is tight, the movement is tight, and the enemies look incredible. I love the backgrounds that they've drawn here. Everything about this game is a great shooter. I'm happy that Dungeon Explorer is on here. I think this game was actually more popular in Japan than it was in America, and actually got some other side games later on, from what I understand, but, um... But I remember how good this game is. You can play as a bunch... It, it's sort of like a primitive action RPG game with a kind of gauntlet feel. But it, it's a little bit more than that because you can actually talk to NPCs and 
and townspeople and you can level up and you can get items and things so it feels a little bit more complicated than that but the uh the gauntlet style combat where enemies spawn out of these little spawn points that you can destroy and you throw uh your sword or spear or whatever at them it's, it's very similar to that you can play as a bunch of different character types like a fighter or a mage or a, or a gnome I, I guess that's like a, a gnome but anyway it's, it's a really fun game, and it's a good sort of transition point for a younger person who's not quite sure they want to explore a real RPG, but uh, they want to kind of mess around with something a little bit more complicated than your standard action game. I'm, I'm glad this is on here. It's a fantastic game, and I had a lot of fun playing it. Speaking of an actual RPG game, though, let's talk about Order of the Griffin. Unfortunately, this game is licensed officially for Dungeons & Dragons, so I don't know who... If there's any rights issues of TSR, Wizards of the Co whoever like owns this, I don't know what's going on with that. But uh, it definitely was a fantastic experience. It's not bad that it was licensed, but it's just bad from the perspective of can we get it? I, I don't know about that. Order of the Griffin was a heck of a lot of fun because it's like a Dungeons & Dragons first edition or Dungeons & Dragons basic game where you can actually, you even get to pick like elf or dwarf as your mixed race slash class. It's not like you pick a dwarf ranger, it's a dwarf is just a race and class. And you actually create a party of four characters from a number of different classes. And it plays just like a Dungeons & Dragons experience. You talk to the king, you get a quest, you go fight monsters. It plays from a first-person perspective most of the time. But when it goes into the battles, it actually becomes a sort of um, a gold box style SSI approach where of tactically moving your characters around a battlefield, which is really, really cool and unique for the system, and it was a lot of fun. Admittedly, the game actually gets after a while a little bit I on the boring side. I would say, you know, it, it it's a very it's not like playing Baldur's Gate or, or or you know even Icewind Dale or something like that. It's not a, it's not really meant specifically for adult D and D fans. It's more of a kids game, and it can get a little dull after a while. But this game has a powerful effect on my memory, and I've I've thought about making a video just about this. But this is the first time when I was a child, you know, maybe like six or seven years old, that I ever actually got interested in role-playing games, and it was because of the cover of this game, which features a Draco Lich. Now, I didn't know what it was called then, I just knew that it was a skeleton of a dragon, and these guys were fighting it, and I was instantly hooked. I was hypnotized by this picture. So this game has this really powerful, visceral effect on me, so maybe my nostalgia is overloading me, but uh, I just think it's a great experience. I really want this to be on the system. It was one of the best things on there, one of the most unique things on there. It, it's just a heck of a lot of fun. I highly recommend that this be on there. It, you know, it has to be. It's one of the best things on there. Uh, speaking about some of the other things that were officially mentioned, uh, they did talk about Alien Crush, which is a pinball game. I'm not all that into pinball or pinball games, but I do very much remember Devil's Crush. It was a tight game, it was it played well, I enjoyed it, but again, I'm not really into pinball games, but just the look of the game actually lingered in my memory, like it was that unique and interesting, this sort of evil medieval fantasy thing. You know, like, the TG-16 was bright and colorful, but it also could weirdly do darkness and grimness, like in Legendary Acts 2, really well. I don't know why that is, but it looked really scary. I don't know what the pinball playing community thinks about Alien Crush, whether that's better or Devil's Crush is better. I don't know if I would really play either of those games that much. I mean, I might play Devil's Crush just because it's, you know, a unique, you know, memory in my childhood. But, you know, I mean, it, it's it's definitely enjoyable. Uh, they also mentioned China Warrior, which is... Uh, I, I don't know why this is on here, because it's not a good game. It's like a Kung Fu for the NES ripoff, or, or is it a port? I don't remember, but it's really badly done, and it just looks, uh, you know, it just... It's, it's no bueno as a game. I really didn't like that. This is probably the most controversial thing I'm going to mention here, but Somer Assault, also known as Mesopotamia. Now, what exactly is this game? I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know how to describe the game. You play as a, 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 a slinky, maybe, who can shoot fi gun bullets from either side of him, and you wander around a maze... And you fight the monster, like you fight horoscope figures. Like for instance, it's January in this one, and you're fighting Capricorn. So you fight this goat thing, and you have to fight all of the twelve uh, horoscope 
astrology figures like Taurus and Sagittarius. I don't know what's going on in this game, but it's a really unique, interesting experience. I mean, you might just say that, oh, this is awful and it's some sort of weird blob moving around a maze, but it was genuinely kind of fun and just kind of sticks out in my mind as an interesting memory. I can't imagine this is going to take up much space on the system, you know, is it, is it really that much of a premium of space when these things are probably like less than a megabyte of information for each of the games? Well, I guess the CD games have a lot of stuff in them. But yeah, it's not, I, I, I feel like I could catch some flack for this one, but I just, I enjoy Soma Assault. It's just such a weird, unique experience. I want it to be on there. And now a game that really needs no introduction, Castlevania Rondo of Blood. This is the best game on the entire system, hands down. It is a great action platformer, part of the legendary Castlevania series. It's a prequel to Symphony of the Night, one of the greatest games ever made, and we'll actually explain to you all of the weird stuff that goes on in the, the prologues or the beginning where you play as Richter in, uh, in Symphony of the Night. The game is a little bit harder, I would say, than Bloodlines and uh, Super Castlevania 4, but I still had an incredible time playing Castlevania Rondo of Blood. It's got amazing anime openings to it. I presume it's already been translated because it's been released on, I think, the PSP and also released along with Symphony of the Night for the PS4, which definitely worries me because it makes me kind of think that they're not going to want to release this one because they want to, you know, Konami owns Bandai Namco, so they're releasing this. So they may want to say, like, eh, we're not going to put it on the TurboGrafx Mini because we want people to buy that PS4 one with Symphony of the Night that we're selling, and that would really be angering and frustrating because this is the best game on the system. You have to include even the PS1 Mini, which was not well-received. You know, at least they had Final Fantasy VII, you know, the almost universally acknowledged best game on the system. You have to have that one indispensable game. Although this is Konami we're talking about, so anything is possible with them. They may just decide to reject it, and it's very worrying that they included it on the Japanese release, but didn't mention it on the U.S. release. That's very, very scary, and I really hope they change that very soon. The game is a masterpiece. It looks incredible. It plays a little bit stiffly, maybe, but the bosses are great. The castle exploration is extraordinary. You get to play as a little anime girl at one point if you want to. It's, it's a great game. It needs to be on there. New Adventure Island. Definitely one of the best experiences I ever had with the system, and I am so happy that it is already included on the list of the first six games that are going to be released. This was originally, I think, a game for the NES, but that version just looks terrible compared to this bright, luscious color. It's just so, it's just so cheerful and happy. You play as this little islander kid who has to go rescue his girlfriend who's been kidnapped by some sort of anthropomorphic monsters and you go through a bunch of standard platforming levels and it is just one of the best platforming games on the system. It is so fun, it is so enjoyable, and I, you know, I just, I have such a great time playing this game. There's a little time trial as you're running back and forth between the different levels and you kind of have to learn the muscle memory to know exactly where to jump at, at the exact right time. It also has an appropriate difficulty level where it's an okay difficulty for a child, but not something out outrageously brutal, like playing Ninja Gaiden or the original Castlevania on the NES. You know, this game is an achievable challenge when you're a kid, and I just love how bright it is. I have incredibly positive memories of this game. It's really, it, it has to be on there. It's one of the most fun, bright, cheerful platformers I've ever played. It's a great game, and it has to be on there. Ninja Spirit. This game is fantastic. It is probably the best pure action game on the system. You play, as you might imagine, as a ninja, and it is just such a tight experience as you can move your weapon all around you, all, your, all around your character with the D-pad. And you can get these incredible power-ups, including a, a, the ability to get a sort of ghost version of yourself, two of them at a time, all around you, so you can hit things all over the screen at the same time. And the levels are well-designed. It is a lot of fun. There's a lot of the action as you run back and forth is really good. The monsters and bosses especially look really cool. You can get different weapons here and there, like a Kusarigama, I think that's what it's called, that chain thing that ninjas use. This is, you know, it's not exactly on par, I would say, with uh, the best Ninja Gaiden or Shinobi games, but it's definitely up there and pretty darn close, and it would be crazy of them not to include this, and I'm so glad to see that it's on there. 
If you haven't played Ninja Spirit, it's great, it's incredible, play this game. I wanted to mention some games here that I don't think are going to be on there, but it would be interesting if they were. I just wanted to mention that there are a number of JRPGs that were released for this system only in Japan. They never made it to the US. And they would have to have extensive translation, unfortunately, in order to put them on here. But Record of Lodos War, which was um, based on an amazing anime series from the 1980s that you really should check out if you have any of you like fantasy, uh, that was released for the SNES and the PC Engine. And unfortunately, you know, I, again, it's, it's a great game. It's really fun. It's a classic JRPG game that we unfortunately never got in the US. Yeah, they, they'd have to do a lot of translation work to do that. Uh, and I don't know if that could be done. Another one is Last Armageddon, which is a game I've actually wanted to make a video about for a long time, but it's a fantastic JRPG that is maybe one of the first games that has like a meta commentary about JRPGs within it. And this was released in the late 1980s, so it was just a few years after they started to exist and somebody made this sort of um, JRPG... Uh, you know, like a critical commentary on the genre where you play as a group of monsters that have to escape from hell and make their way to the surface and um, explore sort of an apocalyptic landscape there. It's a great game, but again, would require, if they didn't use, like, maybe they could buy a Fran translation. I mean, that sounds pretty unlikely, but, you know, um, they, they'd have to do extensive translation. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, there's another couple of games on there. All five of the first Wizardry games were released on the TurboGrafx CD, which is really amazing. Um, I'm a big Wizardry fan, and I do enjoy these games. Unfortunately, I think there would have to either be translation issues, or maybe there's rights they couldn't get for it. Um, there could potentially be a problem here. Uh, because they're just not as fun to play without a mouse and keyboard. It, the, the ease of playing the games is diminished when you're using a controller, so I don't know if I would enjoy it that much. The same for Might and Magic 2 and 3, two great RPG games also released for the Turbo Graphics. But also, eh, you know, it's it's hard to play those games without it being on a computer, you know? Just being on, a, on the controller on a console is a little bit dicey. I don't know if I would enjoy that. So yeah, that's my list of the games that I think absolutely must be on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Obviously, I'm not going to get my wish. Not every one of these games is going to be on there, but there are a couple of them that absolutely must be on there, like Castlevania Rondo of Blood. Obviously, I mean, I'm not an expert here. I, did, I, I do play the system quite a bit, and I have played it since I was a kid, so I know a little bit about it, but maybe there's somebody else out there who knows what games should be on there that I did not mention, so please, if you're one of those people, mention below what you think should be on the TurboGrafx Mini in order to make it justifiable to purchase this. If you think it's likely that they may translate a game, I mean, I think it's pretty much impossible, but maybe, you know, if you think that there's at least a shot, tell me about it. If you think the Japanese version is going to be worth buying rather than the American one, tell me about it. Or if you just have any memories about the TurboGrafx-16, because I'm starved for people to talk about with that, because so few people have it. It, you know, it was it was an incredible system. I'm glad to see it's being recognized in this way. The people that did have it, like me, tend to cherish it because of how unique an experience in the gaming world it was. And I'm glad that this is going to be coming out because it's going to give me a shot to play some of these games on, a, you know, on a modern TV instead of on a computer. Some games that I've loved since my childhood, some new games I only found as an adult, and hopefully some games I've never played before. So, you know, tell me what you think about this whole TurboGrafx-16 thing uh, in the comments below. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this. My name is Michael. Uh, thank you very much, and Castlevania Rondo of Blood better be on this system. Hail the dead.